So back on the show today, Erica Hornfeld. So um, Erica's has just written a new book called Body Aware, which is really good. And I really liked it. I'm going to recommend it to pretty much all my students, I think. So I thought it was a good chance to catch up with that. Um, a lot of people send me books. Some of them I don't read. Um, some of them I read and think of bullshit and never, you know, promote in any way. And I'm not getting paid for this, just to be clear as well. Um, often, you know, if I get sent a book, I think, yeah, that will really resonates with me and my audience. Then we get, get them on the show. And Erica's always been nice and um, someone I enjoy chatting to occasionally on social media and things like that. So I thought, well, why not? Erica, welcome. Thank you so much. I enjoy speaking with you too. I'm happy to be here. And at home in Chicago, right? Yep, Chicago, Illinois. And you generally call yourself a dance movement therapist. Is that is that accurate? That is accurate. Um, in the States, I'm also a clinical counselor. That's actually what allows me to practice as a dance therapist. But yes, I, I really worked hard for that title. And, um, you know, it's always a point of education because not many people know what dance movement therapy is. Uh, do you want to say what that is for listeners who maybe didn't hear the other episode or haven't come across it yet? Absolutely. Um, so first off, um, some people may know it, especially in the UK, as dance movement psychotherapy. In the United States, we tend to call it dance movement therapy or sometimes just dance therapy. But Traditionally, it's the psychotherapeutic use of movement to integrate mind, body, and soul or mind, body, and spirit. For me, I find that it's really the ability to use all of our nonverbal communication in order to observe, to assess, but also to intervene within the therapeutic relationship. Right. I think I've also heard it called movement therapy in the UK um, Mm -hmm. in that uh, sometimes people are a bit put off by the word dance, aren't they? Yeah, it comes with a stigma. I mean, just like therapy does. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't, I don't know how I feel about therapy. So then you throw dance in the mix and people already don't have a positive association with dance very often. So I tend to myself focus more on the word movement as well. Boom. Um, do you mind if I read one of the little takeaway things, the one I shared on Facebook from your book? Because I think it's it's almost a description of what is embodiment. And I know sort of a bunch of other people shared it because it's very clear. Do you mind if I read that out? Oh, not at all. Go ahead. So you've got this nice little, uh, so the book's called Body Aware. People, I'll just give it another plug. Um, and at the end of each chapter, it says takeaway. So it's kind of one of these books that's kind of easily readable and you know digestible chunks. And this is on one of the first chapters, takeaways. How you move impacts who you are and how you feel. I think I'd probably add think and relate and a few other things to that, but pretty good start. Uh, we are unaware of how our actions impact others and most disturbingly that our daily movement habits impact the very people we are. Again, pretty much in definition of embodiment, right? <laughs> um, your, your issues reside in your tissues, unless you become aware of them, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the body hard answers to questions the mind doesn't know how to ask. So super relevant to coaching that one. How you move in your life has a huge impact on who you are and who you become. That is just beautifully and concisely put, which is why I think this is going to be added to the reading list for my coaching courses for next year. Thank you. Yeah, that was really the purpose. I mean, obviously there were a lot of purposes for the book, but I wanted something that was accessible and digestible because I was hoping to reach an audience of people who really don't know what the mind-body connection is or how to access it. The word embodiment may be foreign to them or, uh, you know, may come with a stigma. So um, that's been a pleasure to hear that it is accessible and digestible, um, you know, to, to really everyone. This is probably why I sort of liked your stuff for a while because I, I feel like it's actually so few. I'll put us in, in the in the second person pro. There's so few of us who can actually make this stuff um, accessible and down to earth. Like these yeah. sort of five bullet points, none of them are weird. Like my sister and mom and brother in law would understand all of these. You know, they're very straightforward. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, I know because I think sometimes mean, things like, get you know woo woo as sometimes we say in the US, and I don't think it needs to be that way. You know, yeah, yeah, well, we share that, don't we? And h- how you move in your life has a huge impact on who you are. I think that's the first thing, isn't it? People don't get that embodiment isn't just body language, that it's uh, the link goes the other way. It's not that who you are is showing in your body, but your body is creating who you are. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think we've been in this system for so long that suggests that the mind reigns supreme, you know, from the neck up is kind of where all of the knowledge is. And it almost feels like new information that the body could be what receives everything, you know, all of the experiences are create who we are. And that's not new information at all. Um, you know, not only have researchers been talking about it for several decades, but I think we can all agree that it's, it's ancestral, right? There's some, there's some indigenous practice there. And I, I just, I guess I, I was hoping to add to the mainstream discussion about that. Um, you know, cause some people are still, they still speculate like, Oh, I don't know. I mean, it makes sense. But, um, however, like if we look at a developmental standpoint, I mean, our movement is how we relate in our environment. It's how we create relationships. And then just the fact that we don't really remember it. We tend to only remember things when, you know, the, the higher cognitive processes come online and memory is developed doesn't mean that the experiences we had early on that shaped who we are didn't matter or didn't exist. So I think it's important that people know, regardless of how old you are, you can always go back and repattern those developmental movement patterns. You can always look to improve how you move to permanently change who you are, how you think, how you feel. Again, going back to that, that definition of embodiment. Right. And the second part of it here, as you say, is impact who you are and who you become. Mm. I sometimes talk about awareness and choice, right? Like the two sides of it, or from unconscious embodiment to conscious embodiment, from, you know, an yeah. unconscious set of things that create and drive us, you know, affect our perception and cognition, all these things, to actually that being created, which for me is just, it feels like a sort of huge possibility, a huge freedom. Yeah, I, I love the word possibility. I use the word potential a lot in certain parts of the book. I think that we're so conditioned to think that how we are is who we will always be. And that for so many people, if I want to change who I am, it starts with mindset. You know, I say my mantras or I believe I'm going to do this. And so eventually I will manifest it, which I'm not here to doubt. I mean, there is, um, I've definitely seen that potential. I've seen that possibility. But when we're not listening, we're using the body in conjunction with that, we're doing ourselves a, a huge disservice. So, you know, to understand that there's potential for not just mindset or cognition, but that it starts with how I show up, how I move through the world. It's a big game changer for a lot of people. Again, many people listening may already understand that, but there's a whole world of people that don't. And so they continue to move in the same ways, expecting new results. And that's kind of along the lines of insanity, right? Doing the same thing, expecting new, new results to happen. I mean, we have to change the body too. And it's not just aesthetically, as you know, it's, you know, how we move through the world. It's how we move within ourselves. Yeah, there's nearly always that distinction that you need to make, isn't there, when talking to people new to this of, hey, because as soon as you say body, that comes with, uh, I remember Strozzi years ago saying the body, not the body athletic or the body aesthetic is a very concise way of saying it. Mm. So it's not like, okay, fitness, because that's what a lot of people think, or they think beauty. It's fitness or beauty. That's what most people are thinking of when as soon as you say body. Exactly. It's always this external um, vision. Sometimes it's judgment, you know, because it's based off of how others see my body or how I um, look in the mirror with regard to my body, this interoceptive, you know, experiencing from the inside out sensation is, is not well developed in most people. I would say that we're, we're born with that. I think we, we, we use it. I don't know about develop it, but we use it as, you know, young people. And then we kind of get reasoned out of it. It's just not made a priority anymore. So then the thought of body being an internal experience is very foreign to a lot of us. Yeah. And uh, interestingly, I feel like I've developed that skill reasonably well, continue as a lifelong journey, but continue to develop that sort of interoceptive skill. But mm. it, it does, I've noticed it doesn't make me immune to some of the societal stuff around body shame or wanting to look a certain way or being embarrassed by my belly or whatever it is. Um, 
Do you have any thoughts on the sort of relation between those two things? Now, obviously, I have a different relationship to my body than the average person as a you know embodiment person like yourself, mm-hmm. but 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 not immune to some of those mainstream factors. Any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a big conversation. Obviously, um, you know, I, I think it's global, but I know within the United States, where we hear a lot of like body positivity, um, and you know, I'm very clear in saying that that's, that's not my expertise. It's not really even a platform that I talk about or, or, you know, comment on. But what I do notice is at least for me, the more body aware I've become, the more embodied um, I am, the more I practice listening to my body, the more compassion I have for how my body looks. And that Mm -hmm. I'm not immune to all of the judgment. I'm not immune to the magazine articles and the pictures and the photoshops and the social media. Um, I still have judgments, but it's my mind that judges how my body looks. When I actually go into how my body feels, then I can be more compassionate to what I need, what my goals are health-wise, right? If I feel, oh, okay, I'm carrying some extra weight, internally, physically, something doesn't feel good to me about that. And then I can make proactive choices about how I want to achieve that goal. But it's not coming from a shame or a guilt place of, oh gosh, so-and-so says I should look this way or the BMI, you know, is this, and I'm off from that. (laughs) So it's, it's still coming from this introspective and interoceptive place. And yeah, the, the, like you said, those feelings of, of shame or, um, you know, for me, like guilt are still going to come up, but I manage them so differently. And then the choices and the decisions that I make still come from an embodied place, not from a societal pressure. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Let's go back to this idea of potential then, because in this kind of work, there is, it's not just learn something different. It's learn to be something different. Mm -hmm. It's you're actually working on the operating system, not the software. And it's like, yeah, you could learn a language, you could learn to juggle, you could, you know, grow your muscles, but there's actually a more profound offer, I would say, with deep embodiment work, which is, you know, who are we becoming? What's our potential? And I guess there's different ways to see that. Some people see it as an unfolding. Some people see it as, you know, you can consciously direct it to grow in a certain way. And it, and it's very, you know, culturally is kind of pretty important there as well. Like America's the land of potential. Mm-hmm. And there's other... There's other groups who have had a potential for human beings. You know, the new man was a communist idea, the future man. And um, the fascists had their version of it, the Uber man. Mm. Um, but it's, you know, it's very much an American culture, this idea that you can be better, you can be more, you can be better. Um, what's your sense of what it really means then to sort of have this potential? Like sometimes I also kind of go, well, who's doing the directing? Can I be self-directed in transformation? Is that... You know, we hear this word transformation a lot, but it's, it's mm-hmm. um, yeah, anything more you want to jam on that kind of theme? I'm thinking out loud. It's not nice to interview you again, Erica, because I feel like I could just kind of chat with you and think out loud. I hope that's okay. Yeah, oh, no, I love it. Um, you know, with regard to my, my use of the word potential, you know, I, I apply it to everybody. But for me, it really came from this place of working with older adults or working with individuals that had, you know, cognitive deficits, memory impairment, and seeing how others approached their, what they assumed to be lack of potential that, you know, mm-hmm. well, so-and-so had a stroke and they can't use their left side. So don't even try. And I thought, well, there might be potential there, you know, like what's the potential for moving that side of the body. So it wasn't even coming from this place of you can be someone, you can become something. I think that is a very, um, that is very Western heavy. We do feel that sense of like, do something with your life, be someone, influence people. But I was just thinking from a standpoint of human potential, like movement potential. And that when we move in different ways, then we're able to or expecting ourselves to, that actually translates to cognitive potential. And then I was having conversations with people who were deemed, you know, nonverbal or unable to comprehend language, you know, were they life-changing, altering, really deep, meaningful conversations? Not always, 
but the potential Mm. for human connection and relationship was there. And then people's anxieties were relaxed. The quote behaviors that we were seeing went away. So, you know, this idea that potential is reserved for the young and we can become something, you know, in our adulthood, like I think through movement, it's an equalizer that potential is always there. And potential to me is really just the ability to enhance, to change, to become or be something else, um, maybe more than we expected or someone expects of ourselves. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I I guess I'm asking, it's probably something to do with sort of hitting middle age at the moment of Mm. potential being narrowed. You know, I I wouldn't say destroyed. I I certainly know lots of people far older than me who learn things and create businesses and write books and all the rest of it. So there's a little bit of that for me going on. But but there's also something in the wider world. Um, I've heard various sort of people talking about this recently, that the sort of best year ever for humanity may have been a couple of years ago just before COVID, Mm -hmm. Uh, the idea that sort of economically things have got harder, there's a sort of slowdown in technological, you know, the idea of progress, the idea of betterment. And, you know, a war in Europe, I mean, there was the Yugoslavia conflict and the former Yugoslavia conflict, but there's sort of, there's a really serious war going on in Europe. And economically, people are really feeling the pinch, I know in the States too. And off the it seems the world is increasingly crazy making. Mm. It used to be, I had a sense that there was sort of, you know, mental illness was a thing. It existed, you know, it's in my family, but most people were sort of doing okay. So there was a lot of co-regulation that happened just generally, Mm. but it feels to me we've hit some critical mass of crazy, of just a mixture of alienation, technology, stress, COVID, a few other things. And I I find myself doing embodied work now, not in the context of what is possible, but in the, which is that sort of hopeful looking forwards context, but in the context of sort of just surviving for a lot of people. Yeah, Maybe it's just a microcosm I'm in here, but is is this sort of dark view of the world resonating or do you see things very differently? (laughs) No, I'm, I'm like nodding my head over here. Totally agreeing with you. I mean, I want to, I, I do believe that, there is good, you know, there, there are good things happening. I think that at least I can speak for myself, my view of what's happening in the world definitely comes from media, whether it's social, whether it's TV. Um, and I hate to say it in this way, but it's like the darkness sells. And so that's, that tends to be what we see until every now and then, well, here's a hopeful story, you know, just to give you a little bit of hope. And then we'll show you a bunch of really negative stuff again, which I mean, isn't fake. Like there is a lot of, um, of hardship challenges happening in the world. Um, you know, not to dilute it, but it does to me feel like a lot of it stems from, a lack of embodiment, so to speak, right? Like if I know what something feels like for me, am I less likely to do it to someone else? You know, just basic empathy. And that seems to be lacking. I don't, you know, I have, I have young kids and it, it surprises me, but it doesn't how much empathy is lacking, even within the younger generation. While simultaneously, the younger generations are actually paving the way, you know, they're creating new business models and and new ways of thinking and, you know, creating more visibility for so many people. Um, But just that basic sense of connection, like the mind body connection, understanding that how I feel impacts what I do, and how I act upon other people, that seems to be really lacking in the world. And that's very concerning. I think, you hit the nail on the head as we get more and more into technology, which while it's great, it, it does offer a lot of conveniences and advancements. It is taking us out of ourselves and out of relationship. And it's really difficult to, I think, bring back that sense of connectedness and humanity and like we're all in this together type thing. Um, if we if we lack that sense of connection and we don't know how to connect to ourselves, how are we going to connect to others? You know, I, I'm not, again, I don't talk about this extensively, but I did put a little bit in the book about ecosomatics, you know, and just this, this notion that like, 
how we are to ourselves impacts the world around us. And again, that's not new. That's indigenous practice as well. But we're so far from that, that it's, it's yeah. easily seeping into, yeah, everything, our economies, our, our, our ecosystems, our planet. It's just, I don't think it's unrelated at all. Yeah, my, my sense is we may have hit a tipping point in what's been a sort of steady journey of what I call the four disconnects. So, you know, disconnected from self, so disembodiment, disconnected from others, mm -hmm. um, lack of empathy, disconnected from the planet, lack of sense of sort of, you know, environmental awareness and disconnected from spirit or meaning, uh, alienation, sense of meaninglessness that's sort of been growing since um, the death of God, as it were, you know, the sort of uh, lack of religiosity, the lack of kind of uh, civil replacement of that that existed, you know, in more sort of nationalistic times. Mm. And these, I think most people don't see how these four disconnects are linked. Like, I think, you know, you just articulate some of that. I think that if one is disconnected from oneself, then empathy is also a casualty there. It's not mm. just, I'm not aware of my body. It's um, my empathy is getting turned offline. And, and, and my sense is these may have all been going historically for a while, mm -hmm. but it's some sort of critical mass of crazy that got here, whereby sort of the normal co-regulation of society kind of became a dysregulation. Like, I don't see a co-regulation. I've also moved to the centre of Brighton relatively recently, so I'm right by a shopping mall at a mm -hmm. beach where people are getting drunk. <laughs> um, and the stag and hen parties, what do you call them? Bachelor parties, bachelorette parties. So yeah. I'm very much, and it's also very postmodern, you know, everybody's got 17 genders and very, very hardcore politics. And in that, it's sort of hyper cognitive, hyper consumerist, agitated, frankly aggressive. It's, you, there's, a, there's an edge to things, you know, on the train, there's an edge. Like I noticed the security guards in the average supermarket now. Not long ago, there wasn't, there didn't have to be security guards to stop people stealing chicken. It, it, you know, you'd find a security guard in a nightclub, but not in, a, not in the local Tesco's. Yeah. So this, this and this is, a, like, maybe I'm just getting old and conservative. So do feel <laughs> free to push back. Yes, but it feels like there's some critical mass of crazy where embodiment is, is sort of a survival skill now. It doesn't feel like a growth skill anymore. Right, right. No, I mean, I... I I'm not really feeling much pushback. Honestly, I'm, I'm agreeing a lot with what you're saying because it does feel like, well now, and, and again, it's based off of what I'm used to seeing and what I've been conditioned or, you know, told the algorithms that I want to see now. But what I tend to see like on social media is yes, now we're packaging. How do we regulate our nervous systems? And it's not because we want to, it's because we need to, we are all traumatized right now. I mean, if COVID didn't traumatize us collectively, then sadly it's, it's violence, right? It's, you know, um, just, just sometimes the climate, right? Natural disasters. And if we're not given these tools, right. Or we don't understand how to utilize the body to help us manage and regulate or co-regulate, then yeah, we're kind of forced to find it elsewhere, like you said, for survival measures. So it's almost like we, I don't know where the disconnect happened. I mean, I don't, I don't remember personally learning, you know, mind body strategies as a kid, but I wasn't on a screen 24 seven. I was always moving, <laughs> right? Like I was always moving. I was, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. quite honestly, like that's actually kind of where I start the book is like, wow, if I hadn't been moving through the dance studio or, you know, engaging my body in some way through difficult challenges, I might not be here. I might not be the person that I am today. Um, and yet that's not really happening for our kids. They're doing exercise and activities, but it's very tightly scheduled, right? Well, I've got gymnastics at four and I've got a play date at seven. It's like, where's the spontaneity? Where's the, where's the wonderment? Where's the curiosity? Where's the improvisation of life? Everything is scheduled. And then in the downtime, we're just on screens and yeah. kids aren't getting the regulation naturally from moving their bodies. And when we're just adding movement into our day, it's not enough. So no pushback here. I generally agree with, with everything you've said. 
I, I, I remember some of my sister saying, it's so difficult having the kids at home for the summer holidays. We have these long summer holidays for kids. And I remember as a kid, I wasn't at home during the summer holidays. I was, I was in the countryside running around with my friends, <laughs> going yeah, wild right. with no technology. I think sort of computers had just about been invented and we might play a computer game for a couple of hours at someone's house if it rained that day, but it was sort of the exception, you know. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, and we had, um, just right, I remember doing Sega, Nintendo, um, but, you know, we weren't conditioned to being in front of screens that long, so you know, maybe it was just my own body awareness, my eyes couldn't handle it for very long. And, and I would lose attention, you know, I could only lose so many times, <laughs> you know, like I could just, I couldn't pass right. all of the levels. I got out. frustrated Quite and so. I was like, okay, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna go do something else. So it's, yeah, we're just in a very different place. And I think we're not being taught necessarily how to utilize the body to regulate. And so it's something that we have to find later on, right? Like. Oh, okay, how do I use my breath to get back into my body? I mean, I have people that can't even name the five senses. I, I, I remember learning those very early on in life. So like, oh God, we're, we're, we're missing the mark somewhere. Yeah, the other one that makes me think we're really going off is I'm just increasingly hear of, hearing of children with mental health problems, like mm. real, real serious mental health problems. And including like a friend of mine who's in the West country, which is very rural. It's sort of, it's what Hobbiton was based on. I think the West country is Devon, Cornwall area. And, you know, even in the countryside, like kids with serious anxiety disorders, um, you know, very serious issues around suicide and depression, um, ADHD, which I have seems to have gone absolutely skyrocketed and just unwell young people. Someone sent me their um, 19 year old to have that for mine for lunch the other day. And they uh, said, look, he's gone a bit off the rails and he's a young man, can you talk? He's like, yeah, yeah, fine round, I'll feed him. And he was mm-hmm. wired, man, he was wired. Um, and just just a great lad, you know, I think he's got a lot of potential to go back to that one. I liked him a lot. And yeah. he didn't seem atypical of his generation and younger to be in kind of a bad state in terms of nervous system. Yeah. But is this also in the States or am I just, usually you guys are sort of a step ahead, which kind of worries me if we're we're maybe even worse. Oh gosh. I don't know about being ahead. I feel like we're (laughs) we're right there with you. If not a step ahead in the wrong direction. Um, You know, I, I think there's a combination of factors. Again, if kids are being exposed to this in their, you know, on their tablets, in, in the news, there's, there's not that it's only the only thing that's happening, but there is a huge increase in violence. Um, and so I think not only are kids having to deal with some really, really heavy life lessons very early on in life, but they're literally being exposed to it. And then nobody's there to model for them how to move through it, how to get through that, because normally they would turn to their parents or the caregivers and they're traumatized too. So it's almost like, wow, now is the time to really support the fact that we can talk about it. We can move through these things. We might need community support or a professional to help us get through these times. We might not be able to maneuver them a hundred percent by ourselves, but yes, it's, it's quite rampant here as well. There's a lot of, I don't know if it's official diagnoses, right? Because then somebody actually has to like go and get, um, evaluated or assessed, but at the very least there are major behavioral changes that are happening, you know? And I think I know a lot of that was because of COVID. And unfortunately, when it appears that the world has kind of reopened, right? Whether that means that, you know, we're there or people just mentally need it to happen. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to transition as quickly. Our body is not necessarily going to bounce right back just because the stores are open again. And I noticed at least in our community that there was a huge disconnect, right? It's like, okay, schools are back open, but do we feel safe to go there? Right. And we're still going to make you go, but are we talking about it? How is this showing up in our children in the classrooms? You know, I mean, I tend to talk a lot about this with my daughter or, or just at least provide the space for it. You know, 
if she wants to talk about a grade, I'm not going to force it on her. But if we don't open up these dialogues with our kids or at least pay attention to their body cues, then yes, behavior is going to run rampant. And then we're going to get to the point where it's like, oh my God, he's out of control. I don't know what to do anymore. Well, did you notice it when it was starting? Because it may have been that way for 10 years or five years or six months, but we kind of, um, we go about our day. We don't really pay attention or know any different um, notice any differences. Our kids maybe aren't, aren't in eyesight as much as they were when they were younger. Uh, we don't want to parent. And yeah, I mean, at some point we just have to say like, we can take a role in this as parents, as communities, as schools, we can do something to help our children modulate and regulate through these challenging times. Cause I don't think they're going anywhere. That's my point. I think we're, we are fundamentally in a more challenging time now. Yeah. And COVID isn't the end of it kind of thing. Like, like I, I think they'll sort of look back and go, remember the easy days, you know? Right. I don't even know how much of this Gosh. is my own life, our own challenges. But uh, it, it seems like it's sort of almost been established now that other human beings are unsafe. So even if people, there's a sort of distrust in being close to others. I think many people have lost trust in governments and media and perhaps rightly, but yeah. there's a sort of mistrust there generally, like in terms of the systems, there's a sort of mistrust in science in the medical system. And where does one place one's trust in the mod, this sort of postmodern context? No one's really religious, certainly not in Europe or a lot less than the U S but still very few people it's considered sort of crass to be nationalistic. In fact, any symbols of Britain, like and Churchill statues regularly defaced by hooligans, I'll just call them that. And like, so any symbol of stability that people once trusted, rightly or wrongly, is gone. Mm. Like, that's right. the context that we're doing our work in now, which I think is different than 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean... My thought around like just that word stability, you know, is that if we were living in a community, I won't even say world, just if you're living in a community where you feel secure, whatever that means for you, because obviously it's different for everyone, then we don't necessarily challenge or need stability elsewhere, right? Like to put it in another context, my um, supervisor, uh, colleague, actually professor for many years, highlighted for me that you know, if one area of your life is feeling unstable, then it's really important to focus on another part that does. However, mm -hmm. I've definitely mm -hmm. had periods of my life where everything feels unstable. And then it's like, what do I <laughs> right. go? Where do I, right? Like, where do I go? And honestly, coming yeah. back to this yeah. idea of, of self, that's actually been where I find clarity is like, okay, the only certainty that I have in this moment is my body. And if I draw my attention to it and just find my own stability or a sense of balance within me, that in some way does radiate outward. And then maybe I find stability in a different environment or, you know, not to knock travel or, or kind of this nomadic existence, but I'm noticing lots of people constantly moving around. And while yeah. that can be lovely because maybe their home is within themselves I also wonder where is the rooting? Where is the stability? You know, is there a reason that you're constantly moving around and can't actually stay in one place? Or is it really just this existential, I am the stability that I need and I take that wherever I go? I don't know. Um, but I'm noticing that a lot more, especially because people can be mobile in their businesses. Um, and while the resources yeah, yeah, are available... Yeah, I mean we're so much in, more in our heads. You know, I, I need a resource. I go to the internet. Well, that's not really an embodied place. <laughs> so again, we like, how do we draw ourselves back to the body where we can find these basic survival needs? Yeah. I've talked about the body being sort of anchor in chaotic times. Yeah. And it, it's certainly normal to move around now. Like, you know, my family are Irish immigrants. So I'm from a, you know, that background. Mm -hmm. um, but that was quite unusual back in the day. And it was, it was from Ireland to England, which isn't that far culturally and geographically. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the, the sort of immigrant population of Europe is, is really significantly bigger than when I was a child. 
and there's obviously pros and cons to that lots of good things that come with it the food is great etc cetera, etc cetera. <laughs> but there are like it's normal to not be from where you live now like i live in a block of flats and two-thirds of the people here are from dubai and the mm. the maintenance guys from palestine and they're lovely actually i get on very well with them but they're not from here mm. i don't say that in any sort of hardcore right-wing way in case anyone's getting alarmed but in terms of the context of displacement and the same if i'm a virtual worker in portugal or mexico which i've done in the last two years i'm not from there i'm not of that land I don't have a tie to it or a commitment to it in the same way I can come and go, which is a wonderful freedom. And, you know, I'm glad my ancestors could come to England and I'm glad that I can go to Mexico. And, you know, it's nice to have neighbours that aren't, that are a bit different. And there's a, there's an instability to that that I think nobody really wants to talk about because it starts to sound like some crazy right wing conspiracy. <laughs> if you don't word it very, very carefully. Yeah, I mean, I, I have been on the receiving end of, you know, kind of some of, I guess, as we talk, we think about it now or talk about, you know, kind of cancel culture. And it, it does make it hard to have a conversation, which honestly, I think conversation is where we learn. It's where we learn, you know, about ourselves, but it's also where, where we learn about others, you know, and to just kind of immediately hear something, assume it and then judge it and cancel it, right? Or stop talking about it. Again, not only is it a mental you know, or a cognitive thing, but it has huge impacts on both bodies, right? The person that is kind of stopping the conversation and the person that is also being stopped in the conversation. And it just feels like this free flow with regard to differing opinions, different perspectives, is just really missing. And, and again, not to say that there aren't things out there that rightfully harm people. I get that. But we're in this time where we're kind of afraid to just dialogue. And then we limit what we say, even if it comes from the best of intentions. Um, that's been hard yeah. because I, I love, I like to talk. I like to have conversation and I don't know that I'm doing <laughs> something say. right. It's, I don't know what necessarily if I'm doing something wrong, unless I'm able to kind of bounce that off of someone or to hear like, okay, where are you coming from? Why was that received this way? Now, what can I do right. with that information? Um, we're, yeah, right. I hope it swings the other way at some point, but I don't know. <laughs> I've been waiting for it to, to reach peak bullshit for a while. It doesn't seem to have done. I do see sort of increasingly people sort of kind of going, hang on a minute, and more and more good people like you and me get kind of cancel attacks on us. And if you know the people involved, you're just like, what, them, what? And I, I guess it's also it's coming from dysregulation. Yes. You know, there's a lot of trauma. dysregulation in trauma in, uh, we could say, activist communities. Yeah. And I think the fundamental mistake was thinking the way to feel okay was to control the universe, including other people, what they say and what they do. And the, the extension of harm or violence into words. I think these were the main mistakes because the whole point of words is that you don't do violence. The whole point of words, you can work things out. Yeah. And as soon as we said words are now violence and you can harm people, by having a different opinion, as opposed to, you know, something like bullying or genuine harassment or something like this, which, you know, there are, there are, there's a line. Right. And as soon as we extended it and say, okay, you're no longer adults responsible for self-regulation, everybody else is responsible for your feelings. I mean, that's what being offended is. It's saying you're, you're responsible for my feelings. Yeah. It's, it's a bizarre concept when you break it down. And as, yeah, as and that, but then when that became a norm, we educated young people that it started moving into organisations and even into laws, like we have these uh, inverted commas hate speech laws in the UK. At that point, conversation is over. And at that point, it's crazy making for everyone because you can't think out loud and there's an eggshell walking because I don't know what's going to offend you. And I want to be able to have a different opinion. Right. I mean, look, even in the United States where I feel like... Um, Obviously, there's this freedom of speech, but uh, in so many ways, there's been so much more censorship. And I don't even mean of like media or information. It's just in how we censor ourselves, right? Because like you said, I, well, I'm walking on eggshells. 
if I don't know what to say, then I just won't say anything. And that does, that goes, that doesn't go away. You know, I notice how I carry it in my body or how I was carrying Sorry, it. Sorry, Erica, we make- missed that last sentence. Can you repeat that last sentence? Like, cut out for a minute. Oh yeah, uh, just you know, with the idea of censorship and not not just government censorship, but how we censor ourselves. You know, so as you mentioned, if I'm walking on yeah. eggshells, yeah, I mean, there's, there's- yeah, that I'm gonna. Yeah stop myself or I don't know what to say. So I'm not going to say it at all. That doesn't go away. I noticed how I was, in, I was carrying it, how it, I'm embodying it. And it trickled down to, you know, how I was speaking, how I was acting, how I was behaving. You know, I go back to, again, when most of our communication is housed uh, in the body. It's cautious, doesn't work. Right. And Sorry, when every, no, no, that's okay. When, um, you know, yep. when most of our communication is is in our body, the the words alone are are not enough to address, right? Like I'm still speaking, things are still being said. Maybe I'm not noticing it or I'm not addressing it. And so I go back to like, how can we learn to listen to each other without actually speaking words? Because then the censorship alone, right, is not the end. <laughs> it's noticing like can we be in the same room together? I mean, I've had people say, you know, actually limit me from attending things online because they don't want to share space with yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've it's, had people it's... go, you can't be around here. And I'm like, dude, I'm not some like hardcore far right guy or something, you know, like I'm a centrist. It's like, you can't be in a room with me. Right. This and is this, this is a, vir- a virtual room, a virtual room. You know, I'm like, I'll have my camera off. Oh, it's fun. absolutely. Like, it's just, again, we've, we've gotten so far and, and oftentimes it, it comes from the embodiment or not the embodiment, but the somatic community. So it's not like we're immune. Um, you know, it's just been really important for me to practice. The, what somatic I community, the somatic community have been surprisingly full of shit when it comes to this. Not everyone, but quite large groups. It's sort of hypercognitive hyper-privileged in the sort of level of education involved, actually. Um, and really seeing things in very unempathic terms. And I can forgive some of that down to trauma and, you know, people's lack of reactivity. But also as embodiment practitioners, shouldn't we be a bit better grounded in our self-regulation to be able to tolerate diversity of view, to be able to be in spaces with people who maybe we don't agree with everything with? Like, I really want to challenge anyone in the embodiment community listening to this to say, hey, step up a little bit, you know, like, come on. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm with you. <laughs> I, I certainly, you know, I don't shy away from from that. And so I think, but that's also my my own habit. You know, when I see people kind of say one thing, I lean into it. And that's, maybe that's a flaw. <laughs> I, need to, I need to work around that and not push back, but just listen. Um but yeah, it's, well, a lot of it's become commercialized. A lot of it's kind of become, you know, I always kind of use the money, Westernized, money capitalistic, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Right. And, um, you know, that's Great not way to why... be a speaker at a conference. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, you know, and we're hearing like, we're for lack of a better term, hashtags, you know, these, these hot topic words, you know, trauma, um, nervous system. Like, so it is, it's kind of becoming a business in itself. And then yes, that keeps us in, like you said, that headspace, that more cognitive approach, um, forgetting all the while that it actually is an embodied practice. So, you know, it's not, it's not new. Um, I was just reading something the other day about, uh, just the idea of yoga, right. How much that's changed and that it's not about what you wear, you know, it's not even always about, um, the you know the poses themselves it's it's the practice of it it's how you take it off the mat and i think the problem is most people aren't doing that you know we're not taking our somatic practices out of the classroom we're not applying it to the world which honestly was one of the, the things i enjoy the most i love movement as metaphor something that kathleen hendricks talks a lot about and that was something i wanted to put in this book was like hey Great. So I know how to breathe. When do I need this? When am I actually going to use it? Okay, we'll do it in your car when you're driving, right. when you're waiting to pick up your right, kids, right, the right, pickup right. line. Like, let's start putting embodiment or somatic practices into real world situations because that's when we need them. You know, so it was like, 
singing in the shower. Great for vagal tone. (laughs) I mean, like I loved your embodiment um, series, you know, on basically around the house. Like how do we practice being in our bodies in the kitchen when we're making tea, you know, in the bathroom, when we're getting ready in the morning, like we don't have to reserve it. It It's surprisingly not very popular that one. (laughs) What's that? What'd you say? (laughs) It wasn't very popular, that one. It's interesting. It was called Everyday in Bollywood. And it was. I'm very proud of I it. Loved I loved it. I filmed I like it. five videos in every room of my actual house and said, look, this is five for the bathroom, five for the kitchen, five for the room, five for the bedroom, five for the office. And I thought this was a great idea. And uh, yeah, it somehow it wasn't sexy to people. It wasn't. Oh, one I really the, appreciated it. Yeah, it, was, it, it like, was accessible. It was down to earth. Right. It was like embodiment doesn't have to be this, um, you know, higher cognitive kind of existential thing. Like, I think it's the right of everybody. It's just, obviously we've gotten far away from it. Some of us have um, the inability to tap into, you know, or even understand like where the mind body connection exists within us. And yet it's there, you know? So to me, that was the whole thing is like, how, how can we start bringing these practices into real world, real life situations? Um, you know, especially because there's so much trauma and anxiety and nervous system dysregulation going on. Given everyone's crazy, let's last five minutes then. Let's do some, <laughs> some practical tips, a little thoughts sure. from your book. I, 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 I sometimes I feel that like council culture people don't really have a practice, and it's it's very cognitive, very clever, it's very much internet based sort of a word game, really, sort of a sort of very academic word game. And let, let's move away from that to the positive then. So from your book, Body Aware by Erica Hornthorpe, what are, give us two or three little practical embodiment practices from that. Yeah. Um, well, the first one, I don't even know if it's an embodiment practice, but it's just asking yourself the question of how are you moving? That's actually how I start the book off is just asking yourself, how am I moving today? And answer that question. <laughs> how am I moving? Am I moving How do I relate to movement in my life? Is it only exercise? Because that's a very small piece of the movement wheel, if you will. So that's more of a, that's more of a cognitive, you know, asking a wonderment, but the exercise that I find most useful, it's a very small snippet towards the end of the book. I call it acing your mental health. And it's really body aware in in an acronym. So the A stands for awareness. So bring awareness to how you're moving. The C is to challenge your movement. So shift your posture or gesture in a different way. Um, Get up and move to a different part of the room. Change your perspective. And the E stands for expand your movement. So if there's a way to bring in a different pacing, more rhythm, larger space, When we challenge and expand our movement, that's when the change in the mind happens. That's when we build more resilience. We increase that empathy, which we've been talking about throughout our discussion. Um, Very simple, strategic, body aware practice that anybody can do. And it doesn't take hours a day. Um, Leave a note on your phone, write a post-it, put it in your calendar. Just start acing your mental health on a regular basis and you will it's a game changer. Like you will definitely see the, the change in your mind and your body. Nice. Nice. Thank you. And where, where do people find you online? Um, I laugh because as you know, as much as I throw social media under the bus, uh, that tends to be where I'm most visible these days, mostly on Instagram. My handles the therapist who moves you. Um, I'm on Facebook, but i um, not really sure what it's for anymore. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know how to use the algorithm on Facebook, but I, I do try to be uh, right. present and answer people's messages. Um, and then they can find me on my website, ericahornthal.com. And um, I love to, I love to talk. I love to bring conversations off of the internet. So I encourage anybody that's wanting more of this or just want a dialogue, please reach out. I would love to have a conversation. Well, Erica, I find your stuff very accessible, very clear. So um, I hope the book does really, really well. Just it looks, you know, it's just so readable. It's nice, good size. North Atlantic, so well published. Well done on the publisher there. And uh, yeah, it just needs a reference saying, you know, Mark Walsh in there a couple of times. That that was the only thing that's missing, Erica. Other than that, it's amazing, and I highly recommend it. Oh, well, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. <laughs>